Hello and welcome to this Blackwell Online podcast. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is philosopher Julian Bergini. Julian's books include the best-selling collection of thought experiments, The Pig That Wants to Be Eaten, a very short introduction to atheism, and his account of living in England's most typical postcode area, in every town. That area, by the way, is in Rotherham. His latest book is called simply Complaint, and is an attempt to rescue that much maligned concept from the armies of grumpy old men and women. You only have to think of John Cleese declaring, I wish to register a complaint, to realise that there is something almost intrinsically comical about complaining. So is making a case for complaints serious, ethical, necessary dimension doomed to failure? So here's Julian telling me what attracted him as a philosopher to the notion of complaint. What interested me about it, I guess, is that complaint is one of those things where you come up against the distinction between the way things are and the way they ought to be. That's something which is at the core of morality, moral thinking and so forth. And yet we think of complaint these days, I think, mainly in terms of, you know, whinging, moaning, getting money off something, getting a refund and so forth. So I was interested in, you know, complaint as not a trivial sort of moaning phenomena, but something that's actually very central to us as moral beings. And the more I thought about it, the more other things came out of, from that. And I, I get the impression that the more you thought about it, the more pervasive you found it to be in, in lots of our everyday life and the way that we approach many aspects of our world. Well, that, that is true. I mean, the, the problem is if you focus on any topic, the danger is you're going to see it everywhere. I mean, this is a, a real danger of any kind of theorising, you know. So you, know, you get into Freud and everywhere you suddenly start seeing phallic objects or something. And also your religious maniacs start seeing crosses everywhere. They see them in window panes, you know. It's no longer of four panes, it's a cross. But it's, it's not, <laughs> I don't think, an exaggeration to say that complaint is everywhere. I mean, I, 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 was, I was noticing, you know, how much complaint you get uh, just in, in newspapers, how much of the news is about complaint, the government are doing things wrong, services are poor, the schools are rubbish, how much conversation is about complaint. I did notice that, you know, a lot of what people talk about is, is what is wrong. So it is genuinely everywhere. And I, I, I did it myself. And it's, it's sort of surprising what people do came, complain about and why. I mean, I found the thing I complained most about uh, was the Sunday paper, I got the Sunday paper, and I'd sit there, I'd be moaning about you know, how they've, it's full of rubbish and this isn't a proper news story, etc., etc. And I realised, you know, the Sunday paper, which I associate with leisure, relaxation, was something that was just an excuse to moan, really. So it has this idea of complaint kind of as a, a leisure activity, a leisure pursuit. And I think there's something in that. But what you want to do in the book, I guess, is to kind of rescue complaint from merely being low-level grumbling to show that there is a sort of there is a sort of ethical dimension to complain there's a sort of higher order of complaining yeah that is that is right i think it's very important to our capacity to be moral beings that we are able to first notice that there is a distinction between the way things are and the way they ought to be and then secondly to articulate that now we should also do something about it if at all possible but I mean complaint is where more serious protest and change and reform start so it's quite important to get it right and so that led me to think about okay well what are the times when our complaints are right and justified and when is it just a waste of space a waste of breath and the basic idea I had there was that if complaint is about you know this difference between the way things are and the way they ought to be then the things it's most appropriate to complain about are things which genuinely should be other than they are and secondly could be other than they are and what you actually find is a lot of the time we complain about things where one of those two conditions doesn't obtain so although it's not completely useless to complain about something that can't be changed i mean there can be a virtue simply in getting it off your chest or it's also an expression of your values to say that this is wrong. You know, it's to go on about things, to dwell on those things isn't constructive. What's perhaps more interesting are those things where we talk as though things should be different, but on reflection, perhaps really they shouldn't. And so that's when I go into some of the different sort of species of complaint where that's the case. You talk about a sort of process, I think you call it psychological decluttering, <laughs> of, sort of sort of teasing apart these different species of complaint in order to see what's going on beneath the surface. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one, one example I quite like is what I call contradictory complaints. You, you find this in politics a lot, that you can sit down in, in, a, in a pub and people will talk about politics and one minute they'll be complaining that the problem is, you know, the different political parties is there's nothing to choose between them. And this is what they go on and on about. 
But later in the conversation, you might find what they're complaining about is that the parties bicker for the sake of it and really they should all sit down together and do what's right for the country. Now, I mean, what they're doing is they're blatantly contradicting themselves. They're saying both that the parties are too similar and that they disagree for the sake of it. Now, that's interesting because I think it tells you something quite important, actually, about reflects reflects something very important about uh, politics. Is in a sense, politics works when it maintains that tension between disagreement and consent. You need a certain amount of disagreement between political parties in order for there to be choice and differences of opinions. But you need a certain amount of consent and cooperation in order for anything to function at all in Parliament. So you know, our complaint reflects something important about the thing we're complaining about. But from our point of view, it's, it's important for us to recognise that actually uh, our, our complaints may be self-defeating in a way, in that if things really did change as we are moaning, then we would lose something valuable perhaps. Now, one of the things you did in order to write this book was conduct a survey of your own into how and what people complain about. So what, what were you trying to get at there and what did you discover? It's always a bit perilous to conduct a survey because your know, research methods can be very dodgy. So I took this to be indicative. I did get a large number of responses, about a thousand, so that's a good number. But of course they were self-selecting, it wasn't a random sample. But nevertheless, I think there were patterns which were quite real. Well, I mean, I, I, I was partly just interested again in you know what do people think they moan more about I mean I was asking them to report on their own perception of it and also what they thought other people in their countries complained about as well but then of course I was interested in seeing what difference it made whether someone was I looked at male female difference age difference and also most of my respondents were from Britain and the United States and what difference that made and it was quite curious what was what was particularly curious was that although different groups complained about different things in different ways, the kind of average level of complaints seemed to be remarkably consistent. It is almost as though we have a kind of a complaint muscle or complaint need which we need to exercise a certain amount. All that differs is how much uh, we do it. I mean, another interesting difference is the whole male-female thing. And this actually has alerted me to something which I think has wider significance. You often read reports which will tell you women do this more than men, men do it more than women, etc., etc., and, you know, there's good numbers behind it, so it seems to be true. And sure enough, I found differences in the complaint patterns of men and women. But what was interesting was the differences between British and American people were more marked. Now, what that meant in this particular sample was that an American woman, her patterns of complaint were closer to that of an American man than they were to a British woman. What's that? You know, the moral of the story there is nothing to do with complaint, I think, is always be suspicious when people say, yes, there is a real statistical gender difference, because it may be true, but it may also be true that the cultural differences are even greater. So, you know, one, one can make too much of a discovery that men and women are, are on average different. But one, one of the, the broad cultural conclusions that you did venture was that the Americans tended to be more optimistic and the Brits tended to be more pessimistic. Yeah, that's because I was asking about whether they expected their complaints to really make a difference. And that was quite interesting because the proportion of Americans who complained with the expectation or hope that it would actually change things was about double the proportion of British people who did. It's just one study, but if you look you know, anecdotally at your experience of, of Britain and America, I think it does fit other things we know. Americans have a greater belief in, if not the perfectibility of the, the human race and of society, then things can get better. They really do think that. British are much more pessimistic. We tend to think that you know, the best of our history is behind us, everything is in decline and so forth. And you know, very few people in Britain complain with the expectation it's actually going to change things and, and make things better. So, you know, you, you can see how the, the very purpose of complaint, what people see the, the point of it, uh, varies a, a lot according to your expectations about whether or not things can genuinely change. Mm.